Hey everybody, Alex here for Nerdy Inc. Coming at you with another episode of Our Favorite Frontier, the only Star Trek podcast on the internet that's hosted by me and Nick. Hey Nick. Hey Alex, how are you today? I'm doing all right. A little right. tired, but I'm otherwise good. Today we're talking about the episode of Star Trek Next Generation called We'll Always Have Paris. Captain's Log, Stardate 41697.9. We're en route to Sarona 8 for much needed shore leave. The entire crew is looking forward to the diversion. On a personal note, I have allowed myself the luxury of a head start. Nick, what did you think of We'll Always Have Paris? Boring. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is an episode that I... I feel bad reviewing because on paper, I feel like all the elements are there to make an interesting episode, but I feel like something was missing and I don't know what that something is. It just wasn't too interesting to me. Yeah. Well, I did notice right off the bat, um, they rely on the holodeck a lot. They they introduced it and they're like, we need to put this in every single episode because it's the greatest thing that ever happened. And also, my phone autocorrects holotech to homosexual, if anyone wanted to know. Uh, interesting. Interesting indeed. Yeah, um, I don't know. I guess I don't really care that much. Basically, the holodeck, it wasn't, I, I don't feel like the holodeck was a source of the conflict, so I kind of don't care. Like, yeah, if Picard wants to go and sort of relax and or sort through his troubles on the holodeck, that's fine. I don't really have an issue with that. Um, it wasn't it wasn't like the driving force of the episode. I guess my bigger issue is that the driving force of the episode was um, kind of, kind of, it was so bland. I don't know how else to describe it. It's like, oh, we can, we found this other dimension. So, all right, so before I go into this, actually, let's let's just recap the episode real quick. Picard is fencing, in on the Enterprise, and all of a sudden he notices, oop, we had a little, a uh, little bit of deja vu here, where the last like second or two repeated, and then. Uh, they go, oh, well, we got a distress call, and they go there, and it's Dr. Mannheim, and he's doing some some tests to be like, ah, there's other dimensions, and time is the limiting factor, and Dr. Mannheim is also married to a girl that Picard was in love with right before he went to the academy, so Picard's got some, got a little bit of, uh, got some feelings there, he's got to work through. They eventually figure out the problem, kind of solve it, and then Picard gets to say goodbye to his loved one for good this time. And even describing the episode, you can tell nothing really happens. Yeah, I guess I guess the big issue is, typically going forward in Star Trek, you'll see that the episodes sort of have two things going on. They have this sci-fi story that is anchored by a character that's trying to work through a personal problem. So... You know, oh, my name's Jordy, and I can't seem to get a girlfriend. Also, there's this other sci-fi thing, and at the end of the day, it sort of all wraps together. And Jordy feels good about the fact, feels good about his self-esteem, even because throughout his thing, you know, whatever. I kind of just made that up, but I also kind of didn't. Um, and so here we have an, a situation where, you know, they try to anchor this story about the past with Picard's or they try to anchor this time travel ish story with Picard's relationship, but they they didn't, I guess they didn't really take it full advantage of the time travel element because that seemed like a lot of fun to me, particularly in the part where the two people get on the turbo lift and or sorry, uh, Riker, Picard and data get on the turbo lift and then, the other Riker, Picard, and Data are sort of on a little delay, and they're like, ah, you're me. I'm you. Oh, my God. That could that that could have been like a whole big part of the episode is that there's these time loops are causing multiple people 
Mm-hmm. And it could have caused multiple problems for them to solve. Yeah, and that could have been that could have been an interesting situation right there. Is, oh, you've got two Captain Picards. What do we do? Well, how about, like, near the end of the episode when Data is, you know, going to defuse the time situation and then there ends up being three of him. Oh, man. Which one's the real Data? Which one's the one who's supposed to drop the thing in? And then the, the middle one's just like, oh, it's me. And then they just end that in ten seconds. It could have been a great predicament to really, like, have them really articulate why they believe they're the correct one or who they think is the correct one. But the one guy's just like, oh, I guess uh, it's I'm the one to do it. So I'll just carry on doing that now. Yeah, it's frustrating because especially, the, you know, he, he has this thing where he says, Jordy, count. Uh, and Jordy counting, I believe, is what allows him to sort of remember, you know, sort of keep track of which time is the correct time to do it. But the problem is they, they blow through that last that last minute worth of problem solving like that. I snapped. I don't know if that picked up on the microphone. Oh, I heard it. Oh, okay, good. Um, and, yeah, that was – I had to go back and rewatch that scene. I was like, wait, hold, hold on. Three datas, timing, Jordy's counting, dropping antimatter, what now? Um, that should have been a bigger focal point of the episode is sort of trying to – reconcile this timeline of there's like three days what do we do and sort of trying to get the timeline back on track that would have been uh, a greater use of time rather than and here's another thing that kind of irked me is the is dr Mannheim. he's like i saw this other dimension it was so bright and beautiful and vivid i kind of hate when tv shows talk about how great the thing is that we don't get to see uh-huh mm-hmm. Because if that's if it's really so great and that's the part of the episode you want to explore, then that should be the focal point of the episode. I agree. I agree completely. I'm trying to think of an, an example of something in recent that I saw where they brought that up. I, I can come up with an example sort of similar to that. Do it. You, you do it. You're the smart one. Um, glad that's recorded. Um, a similar example would be in the Star Wars prequels when Anakin and Obi-Wan say they're such good friends and they start talking about all these great fun adventures they went on, but we never got to actually see any of them. And, and so, they would have been, you're right. They would have been so good. That would be more interesting movies than Senate talks and sand talk. Yeah. And so the whole idea is don't bring up something about how great something else is because then, then the viewer gets interested in that other thing. And now I understand the point of the episode wasn't about, what's it like in another dimension but in a in a speculative sci-fi show you're making us want to see the episode that ultimately didn't get made you're like oh why couldn't we have seen an episode where they see this other dimension since it seems so great i have a little thing to talk about and it's gonna go nowhere most of the things i bring up really have no real resolve but let's talk about that encounter where Picard goes into the holodeck to, to go to the date site that he missed. Okay. And I had a bunch of problems with that. And mostly because of this one thing. What year What year is it? Oh, it's 22... Let me just look it up. 2364. So it's 300 years more than now. Yeah. Do you think... When Picard was in the Academy, which had to be maybe 20, 30 years prior to um, this, mm-hmm. that Paris would have the exact same cultural aspects as a, as a cafe of that capacity. It's funny you mentioned that because I was thinking about the exact same thing. Really? Uh, I thought I was cra- like just being a snob because I because, you know, I've been to Paris and I know what it's like there. So I was like, you know, it's too, so stereotypically... French, and they really hone in on ideas that we know. Like, in the beginning of the episode, Picard is fencing. Like, there wasn't something else in the past 300 years for leisure activity that they could have made up to put in. But no, we rely so much on, like, a lot of 20th century tropes and stuff. They don't want to invent anything else. Does it because we're familiar with those things that we can relate to that? It's like, oh, 
it's a classic cafe setting in Paris. They must be in Paris. Well, to be fair, the Eiffel Tower is not going anywhere. And I can't, you know, the guy goes, oh, would you like some wine or cheese? And, you know, wine is good and cheese is good. I'm sure that will always be readily available in France. But that's not what, that's not like all they eat. Well, yeah, I know. But here's here's the big issue that I had with it was uh, Picard's, well, everyone except Picard had a French accent. And if you recall, uh, at the very one of the early episodes of TNG, Data points out, oh, oh so rudely to Picard, that French is a dead language and that no one speaks French anymore. Well, that would explain why no one was speaking French. Yeah, but they all had French accents. Well, maybe they had accents, but just don't speak the language. Uh, well, the one guy said, je ne sais pas. People speak Latin, dude. I don't know what to tell you. Listen, all I know is all I, all I know is that you, you, there's sometimes when you got to give the show some slack, and sometimes it's right. And I'll give them some slack on having cheese, wine, and Eiffel Towers. I won't give them some slack of having the general aura be very stereotypically French because you don't need it. Now, let's talk about the other problem I had with that scene. Okay. What the fuck was that girl wearing? Yeah, future fashion is, is going to be rocky throughout every... I mean, to be fair, every sci-fi show that has the future, uh, the fashion is always comically bad. Um, yeah, but, like, I understand that our society is getting more sexualized, but by God, that's going to be your choice for a date at a Paris cafe. Yeah, why not? What's, I, I mean, if you're going to, you know, clubbing or something, I get that, but you're just having coffee. Speaking of that date, what did you think of what Picard said um, when he was sort of talking to the holographic girl from the past um, about why he w- why he didn't show up? What? How? What just? I'm just curious your thoughts on Picard as a character, and does that? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I feel like he's a man of regret. Mm-hmm. That's what I'm picking up from this scene alone. I'm trying to think of other examples of that would be the case, but obviously he's revisiting this uh, this moment to kind of figure out why he did what he did, and he kind of regrets the fact that he didn't show up. So there's that. But what what do you does now? I I don't remember explicitly, and forgive me. I know I I just watched this episode, but. You know, I I can't retain everything. Did they mention that she was going to be coming to the ship, or was that just like a random surprise? Uh, I believe when when uh, the guy said Doctor Mannheim, uh, Picard realized, oh Mannheim, that means she must be there with him. Oh, okay. Because Deanna Troy said, I noticed there was a spike in your emotional states. Are you sure you're, you know, prepared to deal with what you're about to deal with? Can I ask you a question about her really quick? Troy? Yeah, why does she wear gray and a uniform that's unlike anyone else's? Um, well, one, because she's, the actress is very pretty and they want to get some TNA on the show. But the in-canon reason is I don't believe she was initially conceived as an official Starfleet officer. I think she was like an independent for lack of a better term, an independent contractor to someone just to be the psychologist on the uh, Enterprise, but she wasn't actually a, a member of Starfleet. I think that was the case, but that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. I listen, man. You got, you got to make up whatever <laughs> reasons you can to get the cleavage on the show. I mean, I understand sexy apparel, but they could have gave her a regular color, or they could have got titties for everybody. <laughs> Yar, Crusher. I mean, Crusher wears that. Well, Yar's dead, you know, so. Yar, she's not in my heart. Oh, okay. She's not dead. She'll forever be in that hollow deck. Mm-hmm. Okay. What else would you like to discuss before I start rambling about titties and stuff? So the one thing I will say about that scene in particular, because I found it interesting, was uh, this is the first time, with the exception of a little bit in the pilot, where I think they really doubled down on Picard's um, I don't want to say his flaws, but I'll say his flaws for lack of a better term, where Picard is a man who 
sort of he's he's a career man. He's for he's career military, although Starfleet shouldn't be described as the military, and he's afraid to settle down. He's afraid to make a family. He tells himself, "Oh, you know, I really don't want that. I I want to go out and I want to explore and I want to do these things for Starfleet." This was the first time where we really see Picard embody that. He's like, "Oh, I don't want. I'm afraid of settling down. I don't want to settle down." And this is something that's going to come up many times in the show, particularly in one of the best episodes of Star Trek, The Next Generation. This idea that Picard um, doesn't want a family. He's just he's he's all about Starfleet and he's all about going out there and exploring and being the boss. So I just found it interesting that that was the first time that those seeds were planted for this character. Um. And then other than that, I thought it was kind of boring. I felt like there was some so much wasted potential in this fun sci-fi plot of this little deja vu time travel thing. There was uh, the ending was rushed and I feel like it was uh, just kind of a letdown. Yeah, that idiot wakes up and he's like, where's my wife? And she's in the room. Yeah, I saw that too. It's like, where's my wife? And she just walks from off camera, just takes two steps forward directly in front of him. See, this is this is what I notice. Those are the things I pick up on what you when I watch the show. You ask me all these like philosophical questions about the characters uh, place in the show and how they feel in their universe. And I'm picking up stuff like why did three data's absolutely come to no conclusion to determine that the middle guy was the guy or why is this lady walking off camera or on the camera when someone says, Oh, where's my wife? That's the dumb shit I figure out. Mm -hmm. That's what you need me for. That's true. I do. Cause I would have forgotten to bring that up. And I, I, and I know I thought about that too. I was somebody's like, ah, oh, I got to mention that. And then I forgot to mention it. So <laughs> it's a good thing. You There's just so many things wrong with just direction. Yeah. The good news is two more episodes. That's it. Two more episodes, then then you have to renew my contract. Yeah. And the next episode is one that is interesting. It's called Conspiracy. Yeah, it is. This is about the conspiracy I thought Yar was part of? Yeah, it is. Oh, that's big. They should have had it be Yar. Nope. Well, they should have. You're right. That makes more sense. I can't wait to... Some random red shirt is going to be responsible. And you're like, oh, you. Oh, you have no idea what's going to happen. It sounds, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, yeah. Yeah. But uh, you'll have to wait for next week to find out what the conspiracy really is. Ooh. So we're going to call it a day here. If you've enjoyed, like, comment, subscribe, all that good stuff is much appreciated, and we will see you next time. Bye-bye. Our Favorite Frontier is hosted by Alex Russo and Nick Caledona, edited by Alex Russo and produced by Nerdy Inc. Be sure to follow us on YouTube to catch all of our videos, as well as like us on Facebook, Twitter, and whatever other social media we have.